Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Myung Jin Eun Sun. Greetings. I'm going to do a little Q&A, little audience participation. If you take a mirror and you hold it up in front of a white wall, what does the mirror reflect? Whoever can reach their mute button first, chime in. Whatever you point of it. Towards the wall or yourself when you're holding it up to the wall? Holding it up toward the wall. White wall. Reflects the white wall. Okay, right. Reflects the white wall. If you hold it up in front of a red wall, what will that reflect? Red wall. Very good. If you hold it up in front of a Porsche in the middle of being rehabbed, what will it reflect? <laughs> Pieces of Porsche. Porsche. <laughs> right. OK, so the mirror doesn't discriminate against anything that's in front of it. Okay, audience participation is closed for the moment. So, um, Venerable Sosan, Korean monk from, I don't know, a millennia or so ago, um, maybe not quite. <clears throat> he wrote, uh, well, there's a collection of things that he said called Mirror of Zen. And that's one of the things that every now and then I just find myself going back to because it has such wisdom in it. And one of the things that, that caught my eye looking at it, um, I don't know, Monday, Tuesday, whenever it was, was um, a passage that he uh, said in what's listed as chapter 33. So let me just read that to you. If you look deeply into things, you see that killing, stealing, unchaste conduct, and lying all arise from the one mind. And when the ground from which these defilements arise is seen to be empty and perfect stillness, what defilement could ever arise? The commentary is uh, this teaching explains the relationship between our original nature and appearances. And the capping word is another sutra puts it this way. When even a single thought does not arise, ignorance is already cut off. It goes on to say, the moment a thought arises in your mind, awaken right then and there. So we've got the Zen paradox again. He talks about in one place when a single thought does not arise and then mere words later, the moment a thought arises. So what the hell, Sosan, or whoever did the commentary, whoever quoted the scripture. Let's go back to our mirror. If you hold the mirror up in front of yourself, you're facing the mirror. If you have a bad hair day, unshaven, just got out of the shower, all fresh and clean, the mirror is going to reflect that with no discrimination whatsoever. You could say that's the state of no thought. Whatever is there is what's there, and that's what the mirror is going to reflect. Mirror doesn't make any judgments about, yeah, I think I'm not going to reflect that because it really looks bad. Those bangs under your eyes, not so good today. You should maybe 
rethink going out into the world looking like that. This isn't a mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all thing? This is what's right in front of you. And that means that there is quote unquote good and bad. There is lying, stealing, cheating, getting drunk, going off with uh, and having illicit sex, all those precepts that, uh, you know, when you hold them, they're in the good realm. And when you break them, they're in the bad realm. All of it's characterized by shunyata. It's all empty. Killing, not killing, empty. You could say in a practical sense in the relative, yes, you should probably abide by the precept and not kill anybody. But in and of itself, it's characterized by emptiness. It happens. These are the things that we have to accept as reality. It's all part of reality. The Dharmakaya, the spiritual Buddha, the, the womb of reality includes not only killing, but it also includes nurturing. It includes every single thing there is. It's not discriminatory. It is the mirror. And as soon as you think about it, as soon as you make that conceptual thought of good and bad and right and wrong and all that, you're falling into the trap of worldliness. Okay? And the thing is, not so much that we ignore the relative, but we see that for what it is too. We reflect that, the relative, as opposed to the absolute, okay? The emptiness that characterizes all these things. Now we can get hung up and attached to the relative and not killing and not stealing and not lying or get hung up on killing and stealing and lying and having illicit sex and getting drunk and getting high and just stay there. And you can, you know, abide by the precepts and probably have a, a pretty good life. It won't lead to awakening and maybe you can help a sentient being or two along the way, but it's not going to get you to the point of awakening. Um, there's another bit here from Mirror of Zen, chapter 48. Though someone may injure you in some way, you must keep a settled, not moving mind. Do not give in to anger or resentment. When even a single angry thought appears in your mind, countless obstacles are born. And the commentary is, defilements of the mind are numberless. Anger is the most severe. The Nirvana Sutra teaches, you should be able to keep a not moving mind in any condition and any situation, whether someone slashes you with a dagger or someone massages you with fine water and precious scented ointment. The momentary flashing of anger is like lightning bursting from an empty cloud. If you hang out in the relative and you stop there, and you're angry, 
and the mirror is reflecting your anger. And you stay there. You won't be headed towards awakening. If you can accept the fact that not only is there anger, but you're feeling it right now and not discriminate about whether it's good to feel angry or bad to feel angry, to get caught up in the conceptual thinking about good and bad, I should be doing this, I shouldn't be doing that. This is what the Buddha would have done. This is what Mara would do. You get angry, you accept it. You let the thoughts go and don't hang on to them past their expiration date. If we can reflect whatever reality is in totality, what we refer to as good, what we refer to as bad, except that it's there. It is. It's characterized by emptiness, but somebody is sticking a knife into somebody else. Somebody is cradling a baby. We can get angry or we can say, ah, if we want. But even those feelings are just empty. Second guessing does not lead to liberation. We often call it the state of before thought or don't know mind where everything is just intuitive. White comes, white is reflected. Red comes, red is reflected. Baggy eyes. Didn't really shave too well this morning. Really nice hair day. That's all reflected. And there's no requirement to jump in on the judgment wagon. You can say, oh yeah, maybe I should shave. It would be a good idea if I shaved. That's not discriminating, that's just discerning that in a situation that you're going into, maybe it would be a good idea to shave. White comes, white is reflected. Red comes, red is reflected. Baggy eyes come, baggy eyes are reflected. They're there, they're empty. They have a practical purpose. But getting hang, hung up on them as to actual things that have any existence, that have a self nature, is illusion. It's that flash of lightning. It's there and it's gone. Emptiness. So don't give in to the worldly pursuit of sticking in the relative. Realize that the relative and the absolute are totally intertwined with no gap between them. You could say good and bad without any spaces between any of those letters. The Dharmakaya includes all of it. <laughs>